Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. It's a contracting outfit located in New Prague, Minnesota. Uh, my father started me painting um, when I was 13 years old. Uh, I've been a craftsman for over 20 years now. Um, so I thought using Facebook Live, I could impart some of this knowledge that I've gained over the years to you guys in the form of Ask a Painter, which will be a weekly, you know, 15 to 30 minute uh, live session uh, where I will come up with a topic, uh, something that you guys have given me feedback on, and then uh, I'll, I'll cover that the best I can, and then I'll take some questions from you guys. Uh, so um, send your questions in uh, through the whole process here. Um, I'll be collecting them, and I'll try to scroll through them the best I can and, and see, um, see what you guys are interested in. Uh, today's topic is going to be color. It's a very broad topic, and I'm going to skip. I'm going to kind of hit the high spots today. Um, uh, we will expand on this, uh, get more specific in future sessions. But I thought this would be a good one to start because um, no matter what painting project you do, color is going to be part of it. Uh, in the future, um, thanks to your guys' feedback, I will be doing um, different different topics, uh, including refinishing uh, kitchen cabinets painting the golden oak woodwork in your house. Uh, that seems to be a very popular one. Uh, deck refinishing, uh, furniture projects, uh, and things like that. Um, I'll probably be discussing some decorative finishes, some other stuff too, but I think I'll, I'll go from uh, uh, most popular then down to that. Um, I, I, like I said, I've been a craftsman for 20 years now. Uh, my painting company does residential, commercial, uh, industrial, ecclesiastical, which is churches, uh, agricultural buildings, either restoring old barns or uh, spraying industrial metal finishes on tin sheds, or we call them pole barns here in the Midwest, uh, and everything in between. I do decorative finishes, I do wallpaper, um, historic and modern color consultations is one of my specialties. I, I offer that at no charge to everybody I work for. Uh, not only because I love doing it, because it really helps move the job along. Uh, and, you know, who better to impart that, you know, who's somebody been uh, doing color for, for over 20 years now. So um, I think the best way to broach the topic of color is going to be uh, to show you uh, what I do on my color consultations. Um, the first thing uh, that I talk about with a homeowner is I let them walk me through the process. What rooms do they want painted and, and what is their gut telling them as far as color? Uh, they've probably seen something they've liked either at a friend's house or nowadays on, on the internet or a magazine. So um, you can get a really good gauge for people. Uh, their type of furnishings, the things they've done to the house already, that's a really good indication. It's a little tougher when somebody has a new house and it's sort of a blank palette. You don't really know what their tastes are. Uh, a good example is um, one of, one of my favorite customers asked me to come and do the whole main level of their newer home and they wanted a very, very bright road cone orange color throughout the whole main floor. And normally I would, I would not try to talk them out of it, but I would simply give them the context that most people would not like this color. But uh, one of the pieces of furniture uh, that they had in their living room was a five foot tall chair shaped like a high heel in zebra fur. So. For them, they, they were the outliers. They really liked that stuff. They loved that orange color and it fit right in. Most of the time when I give my uh, color advice, I will, I will gauge it on a scale of 80% of the people I work for would find this acceptable and, and like it. There's always the 20% of the outliers. 10% on the high end who want the crazy colors, crazy finishes, and 10% on the low end who just want off-white, simple, uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, I talk a lot about utility versus aesthetics with paint. Uh, uh, certain colors of paint will give you more utility. If you have a whole bunch of labs, if you have a whole bunch of kids, your walls are obviously going to get touched. So you want a color that will naturally hide dirt. So when I talk about that, um, you look at uh, color cards like this, uh, the lighter the color, still a neutral color, still light but uh, tends to show much more wear and tear. And same thing with the deepest colors on these as well. Uh, these kind of act as a chalkboard. The, a fingerprint will become lighter. So there's a sweet spot. If you have a, a six or seven color uh, card here, somewhere right in the middle uh, is, is gonna be the sweet spot of hiding dirt. Dirt uh, and fingerprints and wear and tear will naturally be you know, somewhere in, in this color scale. So I talk about, you know, utility versus aesthetics. Those colors will give you great utility. They're going to wear and tear much better. 
but also, you know, you don't want your house to be boring either. So you have to think about the aesthetic side. Um, I, like I said, I have no problem doing a whole main floor in orange as long as they know what they're getting. But uh, if you have a lot of use, hallways, stairwells, mudrooms, things like that, think about using colors like I just showed you in there uh, and spending your uh, color capital somewhere else, as in an accent wall, a powder room, somewhere smaller that's not going to get a lot of wear and tear. Um, the, next, the next big question I, I ask my homeowners about is, do you want the walls to be the color? Do you want the paint to be the color? Or do you want the things in the house to be a color? Because before you even start talking about which color is a paint, you should probably determine whether the paint should even be a color. Think about an art gallery. An art gallery usually does not have crazy accent walls and deep or, or very shiny colors. They pick a muslin color, um, a, a putty color, very light, very non-discriminate. Uh, most, most of the time you won't even remember what colors the walls are in an art gallery because there are things better to look at than the wall color. So uh, that's, the, that's the outlier on one end where the things are so beautiful that you don't need to do anything with the walls. Most people's houses are a combination thereof. If somebody has a lot of beautiful artwork in their house, uh, uh, very bright artwork, some people have large metal sculptures on walls, um, sometimes you don't need to do so much with color. Uh, on, the, on the opposite end of that, if it's a very uh, Norwegian, sort of sparse, uh, you know, stark kind of look, you may want a little more color in there if your, furnishing, if your furnishings are sleek uh, or if there is uh, not a lot of color in them. If they're all kind of neutral colored, uh, kind of nondescript, uh, they all kind of work together, you can then bring in some accent colors. Um, accent walls, I get asked the question all the time, are accent walls out of vogue now? And absolutely they are not. Uh, each, each has its place, just as in, you know, take grass cloth wallpaper. Grass cloth wallpaper was used late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, had a resurgence in probably late 60s, 70s, and is now popular again. So it's had, uh, in, the, in the last century, it's probably had three areas of where it was popular. It just depends how you use it and where you use it. Same thing with accent walls. Um, everybody knows that you know in the 90s we all had our tan walls with everybody had the red dining room and then you put in a little sage green somewhere um, that's not bad but things evolve things change um, and especially now with the internet people have much more access to um, different color ideas um, so accent walls um, a lot of times with modern open floor plans, it's, it's, it's not easy to find accent walls. The house I live in here uh, is a 1917, 1918 home. Each room is compartmentalized. It has its own door, its own arch, its own window. You can start and stop colors everywhere. It's very easy to do. In an open floor plan, most open floor plans have kitchen, dining, living room, and then possibly a family room off to the side, usually in a long area. Uh, tough to start and stop colors because there's usually one common wall that connects kitchen, dining, and living room. So what you do is you look for smaller areas. You know, some people have the three-sided pantry in the corner of the kitchen. That's always a good one to do. Um, and that sort of brings me to, uh, I have developed three guidelines for accent walls over the years, just through trial and error and seeing what works and what people like. Um, the three guidelines being Number one, it's great if it's a natural focal point of a room. Uh, and I will show you, um, I'll pull up a picture here. I, I uploaded a folder full of pictures. And I will flip this around. Okay. This is the prototypical room with an accent wall. Uh, as you can see here, um, I, I, will, I will use this as an example of why this fits all three of my guidelines. Uh, and why this is sort of the, uh, the epitome of an accent wall. Uh, number one, it's the natural focal point of the room. And uh, in bedrooms, normally the headboard wall is that. Uh, in this one, this is, this is a very typical master bedroom uh, with a sleigh bed and uh, two, uh, two side tables by there. Um, so it meets the first guideline. That is the natural focal point of the room. The second guideline is uh, you want two inside corners to start and stop your walls. Uh, this, if there is a guideline to not adhere to, that's probably it. You don't always need to start and stop at inside corners. But as you can see, we have an inside corner here and we have inside corner there. When you start and stop a color on an inside corner, it, it looks more sophisticated and it looks more complete. 
Uh, and the third guideline that I like to adhere to is symmetry. And this is a perfect example of symmetry. Uh, the wall is centered, or the, the bed is centered on the wall. It's flanked by two side tables. Uh, lamps are, are symmetrical and so this if you kind of follow those three guidelines that that will help you decide where to do an accent wall now you know a third of the time I don't follow that one of the criteria isn't met and you kind of move on from there um, okay so there are the three guidelines I will I will flip this guy around here I'll find the next image for you guys Um, in modern floor plans, uh, like I said, sometimes it's hard to find an accent wall. So uh, sometimes you need to get creative. What I found myself doing uh, in the past is uh, using the fifth wall, which, which is the ceiling of the room. Uh, when it's an open floor plan, when there's not walls that define a room, everything's asymmetrical. Maybe you have two natural focal points. And the image I'm going to show you now, there's a fireplace with a mantle that, that is typically the uh, natural focal point, but there's also a a very formal built-in entertainment unit uh, which kind of drags the eye up uh, and that sort of competes with with the fireplace there so I'll flip this around again and I'll show you that so in this in this particular room uh, down in the bottom left here you can see there's a fireplace wall uh, there's the formal built-in and uh, we could not find a place to accent so I decided to do a, a accent wall on the ceiling above that room uh, very sophisticated, very kind of elegant way to add some color without uh, forcing it into areas that maybe don't meet, um, you know, the, the guidelines for it. Um, this particular finish is an antique copper metallic finish applied over about, you know, six or seven coats. So this is on the far end of what you can do with accenting. But it's, it's very elegant, very sophisticated, and very easy to repaint if, if they were to sell the house or if somebody just uh, had a change of heart with it. So flip this guy around. Um, with floor plans, even standard bedrooms, if, if the ceiling is not something you want to tackle, maybe it's popcorn, maybe you don't want to try to do a decorative finish over that because uh, of the difficulty. Uh, what you can also do is a little bit of decorative finishing, uh, a wallpapered accent wall, or um, which I'll show you in these next two here, uh, stripes. Stripes are an easy way. Uh, they're, they're very, um, you know, if, if you get the right tape, the right materials, they're very easy to do and very easy to remedy in the future. Uh, you know, especially in, I find myself doing stripes and decorative stuff in kids' rooms all the time. Um, I usually, uh, what happens is, uh, when, when a parent approaches me and said, you know, my young son or daughter wants their bedroom painted, uh, we let them choose the color and it ends up being the darkest blue, the most Pepto-Bismol pink, uh, black, orange, just the craziest colors that not only uh, take more effort and, and time and materials to apply, but they take more effort, time, and materials to then cover up in the future. And as we all know, these kids, you know, every two to three years, they're going to want a different color in the room. So you don't want to put a lot of effort into that in something that can't be remedied. So um, I usually try to talk them into uh, three, three neutral colors, uh, three neutral walls, and then one big bright accent wall. Because with one quart of paint or two quarts of paint, you can easily go over an accent wall in a bedroom and completely change the room. If that's not enough for them, uh, then I'll suggest some stripes. And I'll, I'll flip this around and kind of show you some examples of how I've used stripes over the years here. Let's see here. Okay, this is a young man's room. He's, he's obviously a hunter and an outdoorsman. Um, I talked them into a neutral color palette for all the walls with a uh, with a blaze orange and a hunter green stripe throughout. And uh, because I used a very high quality paint, uh, it will it will actually touch up. You can just roll and, and brush right over that line when when the young man um, decides to you know change uh, change of colors or, or uh, you know grows a little older. Um, the next one I'll show you is another pretty cool one. Uh, they don't always have to be just standard stripes, uh, you know, going horizontal or vertical in there. This is another young man's room, and uh, they really wanted, he wanted every, every wall of his room to be, you know, one blue, one yellow, one red, one white, and because of the effort in that, I was able to do for about a fifth of the cost. Uh, we still imparted those colors, but the majority of the room is actually stark white, so it's very bright. They can decorate it any way they want and then uh, you know easy to color uh, paint over those stripes as well so another way of just using uh, accent colors uh, as far as that goes
Okay. Um, the darker the color you go, and, and this, is, this, this walks a little bit away from color, but it still uh, has something to do with it. Uh, just keep in mind, um, the lighter the color that you go and the darker the color you go, um, think about the shine of paint you use. Um, flat paint will always look better. Uh, it hides flaws in the walls, it's easier to touch up, but uh, it's very susceptible to fingerprints, um, wear and tear, things like that. So uh, if you use a very, very deep accent color, very deep navy blue, a burgundy, something like that, I usually don't give the people I work for the option of doing a flat unless they are, are under the understanding that it comes with a little wear and tear. I usually go to eggshell or satin then only because those dark colors become a chalkboard. So when you wipe your finger across it, it actually leaves a light mark. Um, so when you're when you're dealing with color, uh, you know, if you're doing accent walls, if you're doing, you know, those those stripes I showed you were, were shiny for that reason. I didn't want them to get all marked up in a kid's room. Um, uh, there are there are two principles uh, again, uh, just like the guidelines, the three guidelines for the accent walls. There um, there are two principles I use: one for exterior, one for interior. When people uh, don't know where to start with color. Uh, I call it my gradients of three principle and my gradients of two principle. My gradients of two principle deals with the inside of a house. Uh, if you don't know what color to use, the simplest, easiest, sort of low-hanging fruit decision to do is pick two colors that are of the uh, same colorants, just of different tones, one high, one low. I'll show you here. Um, these sort of uh, taupes and, and grays and cooler colors are kind of popular nowadays. Uh, if somebody doesn't know where to start with a color and, and uh, you know, maybe they're a little skittish about even going dark, uh, most people typically over the last 10 or 15 years have been somewhere along the line of this for their neutral color in their house. Nowadays we're seeing typically this, this, or, or sometimes even this for the, for the standard color that it's used in mudrooms, stairs, halls, things like that. Um, if somebody doesn't know where to start or if that seems kind of like a leap, you know, we can say, well, why don't we try this color out as your neutral color? It'll, it'll still impart some interest to it. Uh, but then the gradients of two principle is, you know, skip one here and go back down to here. When you have two colors like this, you know they're going to complement each other because they're made of the same colorants, just of different ratios. One is lighter, one is darker. Uh, these will always work together. Uh, I have yet to find a combination, purple, yellow, orange, blue, green, anything, if you use the gradients of two principle inside the house, uh, that has yet to work out well. Um, this is a little easier sometimes for, uh, for the people who are new at color uh, to handle and to swallow. Um, they will always look good together and uh, because they're both neutral, uh, you can go as deep as you want and I find that uh, even deep colors like this uh, even though they're very dark and saturated, they're still neutral uh, and you can kind of pair them with everything. So uh, this is much easier uh, than the alternative maybe saying, you know, a, a, a topish color like this paired with a green or a burgundy or a blue. You know, th these work together most often, more often than uh, trying to pair it with a dissimilar color. Um, the, I'll, I'll keep this one out here. Um, the, uh, that was a gradients of two principle. You use two gradients of the same color. Um, for exteriors of houses, I use the gradients of three principle because there's usually three areas to add color. So take, you know, bright colors like this, especially in historic uh, color consultation. What I'll find myself doing is if somebody, you know, they, they come to me with three or four dissimilar colors. They got a mauve, they got a green, they got a tan, and they got a black. And that's fine, but they're all very sort of dominant colors. And sometimes what you need to do is, if you follow the gradients of three principle, you take three um, gradients of the same color and then just apply them in siding, trim, and accents. So typically you'd pick a mid-tone, something like this for siding. Uh, you would pick uh, the lightest color on the color card or even an off-white uh, that kind of acts as the third gradient of, um, uh, for trim and then possibly go down to one of the bottom ones for an accent. And I can show you guys here uh, examples of both of these principles, the gradients of two and the gradients of three. Flip this around again. Okay, uh, interior, gradients of two. Um, this is my house here. This is uh, an orangish pinkish coral color of paint. Um, I used the lighter version. You know, I, I skipped one color on the card to do the ceiling and then I went to a more saturated one down there on the bottom. Um, like I like I said before, with the with the ceilings, um, I use I, I love doing the ceilings only because you know in in my house 
Uh, I have small broken up rooms and there's not a lot of areas to add accent colors. So out of the nine or 10 ceilings in my house, I think only two are, are still stark white. Uh, the rest of them all kind of have this gradients of two principle applied to them. So I will show you an, an example of the gradients of three on the outside here. Um, many of you have uh, followed uh, my 30 minute walkthrough video for the PDCA on this project here. This is one that uh, me and the guys completed early spring. This is a, a 1880s, 1890s farmhouse in, in rural Minnesota. This is uh, before in the state that we got it in. And I'll show you what we did to it. The homeowners let me choose all the colors for this project and I use my gradients of three principle. Um, I, I love for these older homes, I find that these brighter sort of colors uh, work really well with them. Um, even though it is kind of a buttercup or a creamy yellow, I still, uh, I still pick an earth tone version of that. I, I tone it down a little bit. Uh, you'll find that there's a little more uh, putty color in it, uh, a little more black colorant in it to kind of soften it so it's not so pastel. And I'll show you the next image here is a good example of this last project. This is my gradients of three here. Um, you can see I just went right down the color card. Lightest uh, for the trim, middle tone for the siding, and then the uh, very deep kind of ochre golden accent color for the door. So um, these, <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to ever find a color combination, purple, green, yellow, orange, whatever, that doesn't look well together when you do it like this. Okay. So, um, light. Light plays, uh, light will help you or hurt you in your decision. Uh, typically when people look at color, they'll go to a big box store, a uh, local hardware store, and they're looking at all the color cards there, and it's a great place to go find color, but it's not a place to make your decision, only because it is lit by about a thousand fluorescent lights in there, and fluorescent light imparts a sort of dead, bluish, whitish sort of light to it and it doesn't really give you the true color because most of us you know if you think about it in our homes we have incandescent we have uh, uh, you know uh, compact fluorescent which is a little bit warmer we have LEDs nowadays and we have natural light in our house and it's in it's complete opposite of when we go to a big box store to pick color so find the colors you like there but take a lot of those color cards or even check out decks go to your house and uh, I typically tell my people look at the middle of the day uh, so you get the most sun and then look in evening when there's no natural light and you can uh, just use incandescent light and that will give you the two farthest ends of what that paint will look like uh, light versus dark um, samples too i i always tell my people um, with my color consultations i don't charge them for the color consultation but i also don't mandate a color that they have to use i will get them there but i always have them make the last decision decision because i find that when they make the decision uh, and they have a little skin in the game. It, it, they end up picking better colors. Uh, so uh, part of that is I'll sit down with them for you know five minutes or an hour and we'll discuss colors. Uh, we'll narrow it down. Uh, I'll tell them the pros and cons. I'll give them the 80-20 like I talked about before. This is what 80% of the people I work for would, would love. And this is the 20%, the 10% outliers, high and low. People that like the crazy bright colors or people like the very subdued colors. And I just give them perspective on what people normally do and, and what's the cutting edge of, of either end. And then I have them say, if you still can't figure out your color, you gotta do samples. Uh, nowadays, we have half pints, we have pints, we have quartz, specifically made for sample paint. So down at our local Ace Hardware, you can go down there and for five bucks or less, you can get sample quartz of anything and uh, the only key to to getting those colors right is every time I place a paint order it doesn't matter which store which company I have them take a sample of the paint a dry a fingerprint dot of it on the actual color card dry it and that will give you the true look of the color um, the worst <laughs> worst case uh, scenario for that is you go get five or six sample quartz you try them out in your house um, you pick one you like but the person who mixed it, you know, there's a lot of human error and humor, human in intervention in there. If the color in that sample card doesn't match the actual color card, when I go to get my paint, I will make sure it matches the card. So you could be picking colors that don't actually match, you know, what, what the actual card is. So on every, every time I get a sample, every time I get a paint order, I always dry a dot on the actual color card as a sort of, you know, standard and a, and a check and balance. Um, Trends. Um, 
typically, you know, 80s, uh, 80s were, were a time, you know, back when, you know, I, this, this is based on kind of my experience in the industry. Um, in the 80s, we did a lot of off-white uh, and with maybe a little burgundy, maybe a little sage green here or there. Uh, 90s into the early 2000s, um, people liked the warm colors, the tans. Uh, uh, a lot of them picked uh, tans with yellow in it as opposed to tans with red. And then they started seeing more accent walls being used. And nowadays, uh, it's funny, in the, in the last two years, and my, my crew will vouch for me that um, almost everything interior has gone to either grays or taupes, and, and taupe, which is a half brown, half gray. So we still do tans, uh, we still do very interesting tans, but the industry has just completely shifted in, in about two years. I started seeing the first inklings then, and I experimented with it on my own house, and now it's almost completely shifted. You know, we'll probably do nine gray or taupe houses inside and out uh, versus, you know, tan, uh, the, the one out of ten. Um, like I mentioned the outliers before, uh, if you think you're an outlier, um, doing samples will kind of prove that to you. Uh, and when you, if you think that you like very bright, very bold colors, uh, crazy color schemes, the sampling process will help you with that. If you do a square foot or a square foot or two on your wall and live with it for a while or, or even paint it on a, a piece of postcard, um, uh, hardboard and then just have it around the house, move it in different light, that will help you determine because you would hate to paint, especially these open floor plans, you would hate to paint uh, a whole level and then find out that maybe you're not an outlier, maybe you wanted something neutral. Um, my advice, you know, like I mentioned before, is based on um, what I've seen in the past. And I have a large enough sample size over 20 years where you can kind of, you can typically tell what people like and don't like. Um, most of my advice is that. I would say, based on what I've done in the past, this is how it will help you. But I also offer my opinion if people want. But I always give them the caveat that, you know, this is my opinion. Use it if you want. If you completely disregard it, I will not be hurt. I won't take it personally. And sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Um, you know, when, when people let me sort of flex my color muscle a little bit, we sort of find ourselves with some interesting color schemes, and uh, especially in the historic homes, which I can, I'll show you another example of here. Uh, this is a project I did a few years ago. Uh, this is the before picture, and uh, in our area, in the Midwest, typically you find these uh, structures, these old homes, 1890s, um, early 1900 homes. Uh, there's a very typical paint scheme, which includes hunter green, mauve, and sort of a white or an off-white. And, and it's sort of like, I, I almost want to say it's a little more German than the rest of it. You find it in a lot of those communities like that. Um, but they wanted a change. Uh, these people were thinking about it, but they just kind of didn't know where to go with color. Uh, they kind of let me flex my color muscle. I came up with a scheme, and this is what we ended up with. I like to do things that are a little bit different, so I picked a rose-colored paint. I picked a very rich sort of deep mauve. Uh, I picked an orange, and then I picked an off-white. And uh, in these, in the gabled end here, there is actually different different colors of, or different uh, shapes of sh uh, shingles up there. And uh, they, uh, they were not, uh, they wanted the whole thing kind of uh, rose colored up there with the orange window trim and the white inner sashes. Uh, halfway through the project, I, I stopped it and I, I went and talked to them and said, listen, I, I really think we should use this, this orange color and this red color a little more. I think it would be a great accent for it. So, um, I, I halfway through the process, I kind of rejiggered it and then uh, decided to go back and do another color on it. So I think that when when people sort of rely on an expert, you know, or at least take their advice and, and are open to things, you know, you can get a color scheme like that. And and I have not seen a scheme like this um, done on a home in our area like this. But all these colors are researched to be historic of the era. So. This, these colors, these sort of finishes, this placement would have been done and would have been available to people a hundred years ago when this house was made. Okay. Um, every house, uh, especially when you talk about the outside, different colors fit different houses. So uh, when I do modern houses, you know, something done in the last 20 to 25 years, I find a lot of earth tones. People, people are more akin to earth tones with that sort of thing versus the bright colors. You saw the yellow farmhouse I did. Uh, my own house uh, in 1917, 1918, little craftsman bungalow. Uh, I did an orange with a yellow trim. 
typically that may or may not work with modern houses. Now, there is certain crossovers, um, and I'll show you here, with a house that, uh, you know, it's probably a late 70s um, split entry home, which is very typical of, uh, of our area. I'll pull that up here for you. And this house evolved over the years. I'll switch it around. This is sort of the typical, you know, like I said, late 70s uh, split entry home here. This one actually has the benefit of having some timbered areas uh, up above, uh, some brackets and, and some areas of inset uh, to do some color. So this house was like this for many years. Uh, and then the homeowner decided they really wanted to, to spice it up a little bit. Um, and this, uh, this color was uh, directed from them. Uh, so. I'm, I'm open to taking uh, colors complete from the homeowner as well. I think we ended up tweaking the trim color a little bit, but um, this, is, this is a typical example. We had a brick to work with, we had a roof color to work with, both you know, relatively neutral, but the homeowner really wanted big and bright. Uh, the house originally did not have these gray inset areas. I actually did this uh, with the crew a couple days ago, but the, it was the very, very bright gold with kind of the putty or the muslin color trim. Uh, they lived with it for a bunch of years and then they decided, you know, they saw another house they liked, so then we did the gray accents. Uh, and along with the gray accents, I'll show you, we changed the entry door color here to a nice kind of lavender, a, a deep lavender. So uh, on paper, if you looked at these colors and said, we're going to do gold, we're going to do putty, we're going to go uh, smoky, ashy color, and we're going to go bright lavender all on, you know, a late 70s split entry you probably couldn't pick a worse color scheme for it until you see it in action. And I, I personally really like this color scheme. The homeowner is very adventurous with color and has kind of been tweaking it over the years and I, I think it ended up with a really cool result. Okay, um, thank you guys uh, for tuning into this. Um, leave your feedback, uh, tell me what I can improve on. Uh, tell me what you would like to see more of or less of and leave me ideas for topics for next week. Um, 10 a.m. Saturday mornings, we'll do this again. I appreciate you guys tuning in.